So as we move across the facial anatomy in terms of prevention of aging, reducing the signs of premature aging and anti-aging, let's move on to the eye area. My last video was really focused on foreheads and we're progressing downwards. So if you haven't seen my prior video, please go ahead and take a look back on my YouTube feed. My name is Dr. Aram Ilias. I'm a board certified dermatologist. I've been in practice for almost 20 years, I've seen thousands of patients every year, and I love sharing my experience and expertise to help guide your skincare choices and avoid spending or wasting too much money on products or procedures that may not work for you. So subscribe now, follow along, and let's talk about the eyes today. First things first, the area around the eyes as we age is really confounded by the fact that much of the changes that we tend to see as we get older are structural. They are not necessarily within the skin itself. This is really important to understand because when it comes to skincare products and ingredients, it would be really challenging for many products to deliver on their claims simply because we cannot change structurally the way that our eyes sit in the socket. That's just a fact. That's just the way that they sit in the orbit and the changes that you might see secondarily in the skin around it may not be so easily adjusted by just a cream. And identifying these changes is essential so that you don't waste money on eye cream because they are some of the priciest products on the market with the smallest container sizes available. And it always bothers me how many people buy eye creams with the hope of them producing a result that they may not realize is completely impossible from that product. When it comes to the upper eyelid, the most common complaint that I come across is drooping or heaviness of the upper eyelid. Now this is significant not just from an aging perspective, but from a medical perspective, because when the upper eyelid becomes heavy and it droops, it does impair the vision along the outer eye, which means your peripheral vision could be impacted. This is not something to take lightly because as we get older, that drooping of the eyelid will only impact your vision further. So this is something that we don't want to put in just the cosmetic category, it is a medical concern. Most commonly when patients come in asking about that area, they're actually not talking about their upper eyelid to me. They start coming in asking about forehead wrinkles right above the upper eyelid. These are the patients that do need to be evaluated very, very carefully because what you may not realize is that many times when you see deep etched in forehead wrinkles along the upper outer eyebrow, Many times, these are what we call compensatory wrinkles, meaning areas of your forehead that you are actually contracting more so just to keep your eye open. So if I were to inject Botox in those areas, we run a very high risk of getting an even droopier upper eyelid. So I have to very carefully explain to my patients that look, if you are seeing forehead wrinkles above the upper eyelid, we need to evaluate you very carefully to make sure that it's not that you are actually ironically contracting your forehead more so just to keep your eyelid open. And if that's the case, we don't want to do Botox. I really need to have you seen by oculoplastics just to ensure that your vision is checked first and that maybe perhaps a surgical intervention may be more suited for you, which would be a procedure called a blepharoplasty. That's when they actually take the upper eyelid skin and remove some of that excess to actually help with your vision. And cosmetically, there's a secondary benefit. This is something to talk to your eye doctor about simply because some of these procedures could even be covered by insurance based on the level of visual impairment that you might be experiencing. So talk to your doctor about the possibility of seeing an oculoplastics or an ophthalmologist surgeon for this type of procedure and having a peripheral vision test taken just so that you can determine what the best outcome would be for you. Most of the time when I see these patients, once they've had their eyelid corrective surgery done, they ironically don't need Botox anymore simply because they're not using that part of their forehead any longer to contract to raise their upper eyelid and they just save themselves a lot of money and a lot of wasted energy and time and risks of adverse outcomes. So this is something that you really want to carefully evaluate and understand. Now, if it is the upper eyelid skin that's bothering you, there is not necessarily a product, a cream or a topical that can improve this. Eye creams and eye products work or act very superficially in the skin, mostly to add turgor or hydration to the skin, which for some people with a droopy upper eyelid will ironically feel like it might get worse because it might feel like there's a little added moisture and hydration that makes that skin look more apparent. So I would actually shy away from recommending a cream for this area. 
Some of the most common questions I'm asked about the upper eyelid skin is whether or not waxing the eyebrows contributes to laxity of the upper eyelid skin. I have not come across any medical studies that can prove something of this nature. And I also have to say that in practice, I have just as many men as well as, well as women asking or inquiring about upper eyelids, as well as if I do screen these patients and ask them about their hair removal practices for their eyebrows, it's not very common that I necessarily come across somebody who is a chronic eyebrow waxer who did it so routinely. I, I, I understand that it makes sense that stripping wax away feels like it could be traumatic to the skin. However, we don't have a lot of evidence that could suggest that that could be a problem for your eyelid skin. So if you do have personal concerns of this nature, it's not unreasonable to try other hair removal practices such as threading that does not impact the skin. It only impacts the hair. However, I wouldn't recommend going out of your way. If you look at family members who have never waxed their eyebrows and still have droopy upper eyelids, there's a good chance there's a huge genetic component to this and that it's worthy of further evaluation to decide what a cream could do, what a procedure could do, and how much you could manage this ahead of time. Now, the only way that you could technically reduce your tendency towards a droopy eyelid as you get older, you wouldn't be able to stop it entirely necessarily, but at least delay or make it less apparent as you get older would be how careful you are with UV protection. This is something where wider brimmed sunglasses can play a significant role when you're outdoors, as well as considering the use of sun protective eye creams in that area. This can be a little challenging because many of my patients will complain that sunscreen when they are sweating, it tends to burn or sting when it gets into their eyes. So we have to be very cautious or careful about our recommendations in this area because it's really hard to use a sunscreen if that's a challenge that you're faced with. I tend to recommend sunscreens that have less preservatives in it because it's not always the active ingredients causing this challenge. It could just be the inactive ingredients doing so. And on my website and my blog, we do have various recommendations for sunscreens that have less preservatives in them that could be beneficial for you to use just to protect that delicate eyelid skin carefully as you get older and reduce your tendency towards this. The other challenge that the eyelid skin as we get older can face is if that eyelid skin is getting heavier, it can contribute to rashes along the crease of the upper eyelid. It can predispose moisture to build up in that crease, break down irritation, inflammation in that skin. Some people can be particularly prone, be prone to a type of rash called seborrhea, which is when there's a yeast on our skin that we react to, and it can actually accumulate and irritate that delicate eyelid skin as well. Recognizing that this is a byproduct of the folds created by the skin, almost a form of chafing in the eyelid skin, it's important to talk to your doctor not only about ways to manage that inflammation, reduce your tendency towards it, and whether or not this would be another reason to consider a surgical intervention. It's also true that the upper eyelids is a really common area to see a tendency towards skin tags developing. Skin tags are those little outpouchings of skin that can develop on areas of friction on our body and is an inherited tendency as well. If this occurs, of course, we treat these routinely. I treat them in my office literally every day of the week, but that being said, um, reducing the tendency towards friction might be helpful to reduce your tendency towards developing new skin tags.